Hello everybody, Professor Barth is here. Welcome to History of Money. All right, today, lecture 18, part A, we're gonna take a look at the role of money and finance in the French Revolution. There's a big story there for a big revolution, the most, maybe the most uh, significant revolution in, in world history. Part B, the gold standard in 19th century Europe, especially post Napoleon, post Waterloo, post 1815. And then for part C, we'll take a look at the wealthiest banking dynasty in human history, the House of Rothschild. All right, so there's a map of Europe in 1789. And you'll notice France takes up a big chunk of that western third of the European continent. But France is in a lot of trouble in the 1780s. King Louis XIV, the Sun King, that great absolute monarch, a very effective monarch, an energetic, ambitious monarch. Nonetheless, uh, through his continual wars, got France into quite a lot of debt. Now, Louis dies in 1715 and doesn't see the after effects of that debt. But shortly after, as you'll recall in our video on bubble mania from back uh, a week ago or so, um, there was a banking experiment in France by a Scotsman named John Law. It went complete, you know, completely collapsed, turned France off to a French to a financial revolution, and so France goes without any banking system throughout most of the 18th century. So there's no financial revolution in France. There are money lenders certainly, but no institutionalized banking corporations, as you see in England. Also, uh, the long reigning monarch, Louis XV, oversaw a period of debil debilitating stagnation economically, um, uh, several, several humiliating losses in, in wars against Britain and Prussia and, and other European powers. Louis XV himself, though technically an absolute monarch, didn't care too much for rule and, and, uh, and governance was left to a, 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 a oligarchical cabinet of competing ministers who fought with one another and, and uh, uh, the, the grandeur, the, the, the splendor, the mystique of the French monarchy took a huge hit in the 18th century. So that by the time Louis XVI became king in 1774, he inherited a mess, and Louis XVI was only 19 years old when he became king. He just didn't have the appetite for what lie ahead. Um, Louis was woefully unqualified for the job, and he knew it. He was indecisive. He lacked a certain firmness that is needed in a, in a strong or powerful monarch. He was known to back down very quickly if he encountered any opposition from the nobility, for example. And France, by this point in time, is just rife with corruption, low tax yields, um, bribery, sale of offices. The nobility and the clergy were completely tax exempt. France at the time was organized into what were called three estates. The first estate was the, the clergy, the priests, the bishops of, um, of the Roman Catholic Church. And the church at that time in 18th century France just steeped with a lot of corruption, uh, owned about 10% of all the land in France. And then the second estate was the nobility and the, no and the nobility too. Uh, not an entirely impressive bunch. And, and, and then you had the third estate. And the third estate, you could say maybe we would, we would call it the 99%. But except here, the estates, the classes weren't based on income. They were based on title. And so the Third estate also included extraordinarily wealthy merchants or even um, money lenders, professionals, lawyers, and all the way down to the lowest peasant, right? That was all included in the third estate. And the third estate had no voice, no true voice in government. And they were the ones who were heavily taxed. So you see a cartoon here from the, from the age, the third estate supporting the first two estates who constitute an unbearable burden on that third estate. 
Meanwhile, the court at Versailles is completely out of touch, completely isolated from reality. Well, in the 1780s, France undergoes a, 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 a very severe financial crisis as it becomes more and more clear that France, the French government, is steeped in so much debt with crippling interest payments. And again, low tax yields because the nobility and the clergy aren't taxed. There's no land tax at the time. And those two estates are resisting any sort of move to, to, to exert or exact taxation on, on, on their property or on their income. Louis um, has inherited a situation in which there's no banking institutions to service the debt like you have in England. So England has a lot of debt, but you have um, s several major big institutions that service that debt, which allows for a lower interest payment. There's nothing like that in France. And so the interest payments are just staggering. This is a result, the debt of wars against England, which, which France had lost, and um, the F America, French aid during the American Revolution. Now we benefited from that as Americans because without French aid, we would have had a much more difficult time winning our independence. So French aid was critical to American independence, but it was also uh, also just really, again, uh, increase France's debt because France built up its navy to support the Americans. And it was an expensive war. And so many of the people whom the French government owed money to included men who belonged to this third estate. Right, and Louis is approached by several of these men, financiers. Look, you need to do something about this. You need to increase taxes on the nobility and the clergy. And Louis decides he, he's going to go for it. He's going to try to do this. Um, Louis's financial main financial advisor was a name a man named Jacques Necker. You see him pictured there on the left. He was actually a, a Swiss banker from Geneva, Calvinist, and and he came into the country and and uh, opened up the books, and and told the king, "Look, you got to do something drastic." Well, the king attempted to persuade the nobility and the clergy to accept new taxes, but they refused, just utterly refused, making a mockery of this idea that he was an absolute monarch because he, he couldn't enforce any, uh, he could not enforce his will. And so in a desperate move, in August of 1788, King Louis announced that there would be elections for a new parliament in France. Now the name of this parliament was, was called the Estates General. The Estates General, and, and the last time that the Estates General had met, had convened, was in 1614. So think about that. Between 1614 and 1789, the Estates General, the, the equivalent of the Parliament of France, had not convened. Louis announces there will be elections, and in the spring there were elections for the Estates General. And in May, they met in a building at Versailles nearby the, the palace. And the session began. Imagine the excitement in France at that time. This, this incredible thing has happened. And, and the, but the problem with the Estates General was that each estate had equal representation, which meant right from the get-go, the third estate is, only has one third of the delegates. Marie Antoinette, manage, um, the wife of Louis XVI, manages to uh, persuade Louis to double the representation for the third estate, but that still doesn't give them a majority in this body. And so gridlock immediately sets in, and the leaders of the third estate, the delegates there, um, it, upon this gridlock, separate declared themselves into a national assembly in, in June of 1789, and now things really begin to roll, all right? And we're not going to detail all of that here. You can teach an entire, an entire course on this. But things really begin to, to move here, and now 
what Louis has unleashed is it's unleashed now, and and uh, and where is it going to go? It's, it's, there's no telling exactly, but they declare the third estate declare themselves to be a new national assembly in the summer of 1789. You'll notice they still recognize the king as a lawful authority in the nation. La loi et la roi. I took French uh, when I was in high school, but I'm a little uh, uh, it, uh, not up to speed um, where, I, where I used to be. The law and the king. In uh, the early autumn, they abolish feudalism. They issue a declaration of the rights of man and of citizen. Thomas Jefferson, by the way, who was, happened to be in France at the time, helped author much of this declaration. But for our purposes, what we want to focus on is the issuance of a new paper currency, a new paper currency issued by the National Assembly, and that was the Asenya, the Asenya. Now, in October of 1789, the National Assembly declared that the crown lands, the lands belonging to the crown, were now national goods and belonged to the nation of France, to the people of France. And then in November, the National Assembly seized land belonging to the Catholic Church, which amounted to about 10% of the country, of the land in the country, that's a lot of land, confiscated it, and backed this new paper currency by that land. So what they did, if anyone had borrowed or had lent the French government money, and if there was anybody who the French government owed money to, the French government paid those bondholders with this paper currency and told those bondholders that you could use this paper currency to buy any of that land that had been seized from the church or from the crown. Makes sense, right? So, and many of these bondholders were part of the third estate. Financiers had, had bought debt, purchased debt in previous decades. So you'll be paid in these notes, and then if you want, you can use these notes to buy land, the land that was had been seized. If you're not interested in land, eh, pawn it off to somebody else, and you know eventually someone will want to buy that land with the notes. Upon receiving the notes, then we'll retire the notes. That will cover the debt. See, it's actually pretty smart. It will cover the debt, and 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 we'll 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 pay off the debt with this land, with this land, and, and it was an attractive idea. That's why they landed upon it. And notice the note here. National domains, national domains. You also notice on the note, there's a coin of Louis the 16th. Louis the 16th. So in this early period, you still have a, you know, a monarchy. The, the National Assembly is still recognizing a monarch. Well, you have an immediate emission of notes. At first, it was 400 million francs in 89. Then the following year, another 800 million were issued. But by the end of 1791, the Asenya had depreciated by about 20%. Now, 20% is significant. If the dollar, for example, today, depreciated 20% in a two-year time period, that would be a really big deal. That'd be a lot of inflation, a severe problem. But in the case of, in this case, actually, it's not terrible, right? 20%, certainly not as bad as what the Americans suffered with the, the inflation of the continental dollar. However, this isn't the end of the story. And once the printing press is resorted to as a way to finance government, it's very difficult to shut it off. And more and more, these assignats are issued, and it's clear there's nothing there to back them up, right? It's a fiat paper currency, okay? It's a fiat currency. Now, beginning in 17, early 1792, there were new elections in April. Radicals began to take over the French Revolution, and arguably they had already steered the opening course of the French Revolution when they confiscated church land and and declared all clergy to be servants, employees of the state the following year. But by 1792, radicalism fully sets in. And then 1793, 1794, the reign of terror, 
uh, some of the more extreme, um, uh, notorious elements of, of the French Revolution that most of the, the viewers watching this are quite familiar with. Uh, Robespierre, leader of the Jacobin Club, a uh, hard left group faction in France. By the way, this is where we get the terminology left and right. Um, in the, the assembly on the right side, on the right wing of the assembly where the more conservative representatives are a bit more cautious. All right, let's slow down a little bit. Let's recommend, you know, let's still have a, 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 a robust monarchy, et cetera, et cetera. And then you had the far left wing that were pushing for basically overturning virtually every institution in French society. And then you had the middle, the center, right? That's where we get all that terminology from. Basically, the hard left takes over the French Revolution. Um, Louis Dunn, uh, in September of 1792, the monarchy is abolished. A few months later, he's put on trial for treason on a suspicion, not, in, not uh, a totally incorrect suspicion, that he was conspiring with foreign powers to overturn the revolution or to suppress the revolutionaries. Put on trial, executed by guillotine in 1793 the guillotine invented as a as a humane form of punishment and actually we, uh, we laugh at that sometimes today that it was seen as humane but you know if you the blade was sharp and you know it was a very quick death it was done right um the blade was not always sharp <laughs> sometimes the blade was dull and then uh far from a humane death you have an incredibly gruesome death but the guillotines are released, and uh, during this reign of terror, for about a one-year period, an estimated, and it's, it's hard to know exactly, yeah, about 40,000 people guillotined. Um, terror unleashed on the, on the country, paranoia, hysteria, accusations going around about so-and-so is a counter-revolutionary. No, you're a counter-revolutionary, and suspicion, and rumor, and just all the nasty stuff that comes with sort of a... a Salem witch hunt uh, type environment. And uh, so things completely spin off the rails. They change up the calendar and ban Christianity, institute a new state religion called the cult of reason and all just all this wild stuff. Anyway, for our purposes, again, we'll, we'll narrow on the currency issue. Look at that. Look at the value of the Asinia. Um By 1794, there were 8 billion Asignats. In circulation, and it's just fallen to the floor. And actually, a lot of the men who were guillotined during this period were were convicted on suspicion that they had uh, that they were depreciating or causing further inflation in these notes. So, if you're a merchant or a shopkeeper. And you violated some of the price controls because that's one of the things that Jacobins did. They set price controls on, on goods. And if you were a farmer or a shopkeeper and you were caught violating those price controls, you were seen as an enemy of the revolution because you're discrediting the currency that's backing that revolution. And we know the punishment for treason. It's, it's death. And so uh, this feeds into the atmosphere of paranoia and hysteria. Anytime the currency collapses... Uh, you're in for societal disorder, even to an extremity, anarchy and chaos. Um, the most famous example is Germany after World War One. When the currency collapses, watch out. It's uh, socially, it's a very disruptive time. And, and this was no exception in France during the revolution. We have a hyperinflation of the of the paper currency. Well, summer of in the month of Thermidor, as the Jacobins called it, in um, July of 1794, the reign of terror is ended when Robespierre is guillotined, um, but it's replaced by an unpopular government, a Republican government, small r Republican government, but an unpopular one that's not representative, uh, filled with a lot of corruption. It's called the Directory. And even after Nine Thermidor, the downfall of the Jacobins and of uh, Robespierre, look at that, it just falls to nothing. It's absolute, so that by 1796, there were 45 billion assignats in circulation, and in inflation had reached 3,500%.
<laughs> so uh, absolute disaster. The directory attempted to, and here's some of the notes, and you see on here, you know, 400 livres, 500, 10,000. Still the fiction of national domains, but everyone knows by this point that this is just a purely fiat paper currency. The directory attempts to introduce a replacement fiat currency called the Mandat, but that uh, also hyperinflates and is, is basically worthless. So that by 1799, people are ready for order, people are ready for stability, especially financiers and uh, merchantmen, but all people in France are just thirsting for some sort of order again. And uh, that's when this man arrives on the scene, Napoleon Bonaparte on the 9th of November, 1799, affects his coup d'etat, his coup d'etat, this popular general and promises order and stability to France. And so we're gonna end part A there. See you uh, for the continuation in part B.